in to the Rider Review. This is Eric Kurat Rider, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2011 romantic comedy titled New Year's Eve. Yes, I know I'm a little behind. New Year's was well over a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, so I'm a little behind the times. But, hey, you know, the old saying goes, it's better late than never, eh? So anyhow, this movie, uh, it runs for one hour and 58 minutes long. It is uh, directed by Gary Marshall. It is produced by Gary Marshall and Ween Allen Rice. The script was written by Catherine Fugate. The score was done by John Debney. The cinematography by Charles Minsky. And the editing was done by Michael Tronick. And the stars of the movie, by God, there is a whole cesspool full of very talented thespians. Unfortunately, they've all gone to waste for this abomination of a movie. All right, the stars of the movie are Jake T. Austin. We also have uh, James Belushi. We have Halle Berry. We have Jessica Biel. We have John Bon Jovi, Abigail Breslin, Chris Ludacris Bridges, Robert De Niro, uh, Josh, Josh Duhamel, uh, Zach Efron, Hector Elizondo, because what's a Gary Marshall directed movie without Hector Elizondo? It's like in almost every Gary Marshall movie, Hector Elizondo is always there to play either a supporting role or a cameo role. But no matter what, he seems to be always somewhat omnipresent in any movie that Gary Marshall directs. So, yeah, Elizondo's in it. We also have Carla Gugino, uh, Catherine Heigl, Ashton Kutcher, uh, John Lithgow, Seth Meyers, Leah Michelle, Alyssa Milano, Sarah Jessica Parker, Russell Peters, Michelle Pfeiffer, Sarah Paulson. Uh, let's see, we also have uh, Till Schweiger, Hilary Swank, Sofia Vergara. And we also have some cameo appearances from Matthew Broderick, the host of the New Year's Eve. Uh, celebration in at Times Square. No, I'm not talking about Dick Clark. I'm actually talking about his successor, Ryan Seacrest, and former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Oh, you know what? This is really going to be very, very complex, I'm going to tell you right now. In many ways, this is going to be a rant, just to sort of inform you guys. But it's not going to be a rant where I'm going to be angry or pissed off or anything like that. I'm more or less going to rant in more of a disappointing emotion. I don't know what it was that that director Gary Marshall was thinking. Was he starting to deteriorate in his later years in his life? That the last three, it just saddens me that the last three movies that he made in his lifetime were complete and utter disasters. I think that at this time, the old man was losing his touch. Making a convoluted script with really little to nothing to care about. He just threw in a whole bunch of top name actors and actresses just to be in his movie, just to have their their minutes of fame. And for what? What do we get out of it? Zilts. And this is exactly what happens in the last three movies that he directed before his death in 2016. We had Valentine's Day. We had New Year's Eve, which is the movie I'm reviewing. And then after that, his last one he did, Mother's Day. All completely trash. Big names, 
wasted talent, complete trash. I guess I don't know what was this. Was this some kind of like uh, like a swan song or something? Because it kind of felt like a swan song for him that what he wanted to do in his bucket list is to get all get is to get top performers past present and future and just cobble them all up in together have a whole myriad of subplots some were worth watching most of it not worth your time and was just trying just to repeat everything that the 2003 british movie love actually succeeded now i'm not saying that love actually was a perfect movie by any by any stretch of the imagination but at least i'll say one thing about love actually was that we actually had uh, well they had a series of subplots but at least you had characters you can invest in you had at least some characters that you could get involved in there are some really great subplots in that but in new year's eve you don't get any of that you get a bunch of subplots in hopes that all of these subplots would eventually intertwine together with some kind of a, an exciting climax in the end. But in the end, you just end up feeling very, very badly shortchanged. If I was to say something positive about this movie, well then, all I got to say is, well, I guess clever strategy by releasing New Year's Eve a month prior to the holiday season is a smart move that way when it's time for us to be merrily merrily along we wouldn't be thinking about this film as we spend our holiday cheer opening gifts and roasting turkeys as we say goodbye to the old and welcome the new of course we would be spending our times on better things than this failure of a holiday themed film that never gives the impression we're watching a movie gearing through the end of an old era and the dawning of a new one. Sure, it may look festive in the trailers featured here, but New Year's Eve in the end turns out nothing more than a mundane array of small short stories that lead to a famous ball drop at Times Square in New York City with very little or reflective impact on the viewers. Like I said, this is just Gary Marshall's way of just cobbling in a whole bunch of stars, young, old, and in between. Get them into these little maniacal, little, little, um, not maniacal, little uh, meager subplots and just ham it out. It was like uh, like watching almost like a two-hour-long soap opera. I mean, you have one scene that comes on, and then five minutes later, another sub-story comes about, and yeah, and it features very little to almost no character development because we never have that much time to invest in the characters because every time a scene changes, it's a completely different sub-story. It's like every time we try to get to know a character, it segues into another sub story and it's just sometimes a bit of a pain in the ass and i'm sorry to say this but it's just nothing that that we could get invested in so gary marshall who definitely didn't learn his lesson from valentine's day goes on to direct another cesspool of talented thespians playing wooden cardboard contrivances through a series of eight short stories, which by the end will have a connection intertwined between them in both their lives and the characters. But what is that little intertwining thing all sums up to? Just watching the ball drop. That's it. Nothing more. The only intertwining thing happens is the ball dropping. All the events that lead to the ball dropping, that's really where the climax is. Maybe if they stuck around and just stuck with one subplot, maybe it would have probably been a lot more remarkable. But no, we have to have eight of them. Eight sub-stories that have little to no connection except for 
the events that leads to the ball drop at Times Square in New York City. With characters we couldn't really care less about. So we have uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. She stars as uh, Ingrid Withers, who is a mousy receptionist to record producer Jonathan Cox, played by John Lithgow. And, uh, you know, he's kind of a bit of, you know, like the stereotypical uh, asshole boss who's demanding, who who loves to throw his weight around because, hey, he's the boss, he's the record executive, he runs the gamut. And she just can't put up with his demands. So what does she do? Instead of just standing up to him because she's a very mousy individual, she just decides to quit. But does she quit for a legitimate reason? No. She does not quit to, to res for a legitimate reason. The only purpose, the reason why she quit her job as the receptionist to this high esteemed record company is simply just because she wants to fulfill her bucket list. Well, what's going to happen when her bucket list is fulfilled? What she do then? Doesn't make sense. A lot of these, a lot of these subplots are very, very, very incoherent and quite impossible. None of these things could happen in real life. So she's got this whole bucket list, and the person who is going to fulfill her resolution comes with the assistance of a messenger boy by the name of Paul Doyle, played by Zac Efron. Zac Efron! How does that make sense? You have Michelle Pfeiffer, a person who was like in her 50s at the time. She was probably in her mid-50s. And yet she's fondling along, fondling along with a 22-year-old. Are these guys are supposed to be some kind of romantic link between the two? Because it just does not seem right. I mean, the guy was in his 20s. She is in her 50s. And it could make a little bit of sense if she still manages to keep her gorgeous looks like she did in the 80s and 90s. But no, she looks frumpy. She does look like she has aged her way. I mean, she was in her 50s at the time. And she looks like she could be in her 50s, maybe even pushing 60. And to see her in some kind of romantic link with Zac Efron just looks totally awkward. I mean, Zac Efron is a handsome young man. I'm sure there could have been a subplot involving him dating somebody around maybe closer to her to his age. And Michelle Pfeiffer could have looked for somebody more closer to her age. Okay, they don't have to necessarily be exactly the same age, but at least around their age area would have been a lot more sufficient. But Zac Efron and Michelle Pfeiffer, Zac Efron is young enough to be her son. And I also don't bite into the fact that Zac Efron and Sarah Jessica Parker are actually brother and sister when they're also kind of like in the 22-year age gap. It's possible, maybe, I don't know, maybe. Maybe she was more of an early, an early born child and he was a late, and he was from late bloomer parents. I guess that's possible, but it still looks awkward and very, very unconvincing. All right, then we have a dying patient named Stan Harris, played by Robert De Niro, who has pretty much gave up his career and decided just to pick any, any convoluted, any convoluted story. Uh, I guess he's kind of given up his career as a serious actor, and I'll just take any, any story without much, without much thought or consideration. You know, it's like, oh well, I'm a, I, 
I've paid my dues. I've made a lot of money with a lot of very successful films like The Godfather, like The Deer Hunter or um, Raging Bull and stuff like that. I've made all the great movies with Martin Scorsese. Hey, I can use a break. I could be laid back. I could uh, just play any stupid character that's thrown at me. I paid my dues. It's like the guy has gave up hope and decides to just tackle any role that's thrown at him without much serious consideration or thought. So here he is. He's playing a dying patient who doesn't care about anything else except that he just wants one more thing to do before he dies. What is it? Reunite with his daughter? No. Bring all the people who he has troubled in his life and apologize for any inconvenience that he has caused for them? No. The only thing he wants to do, the only last thing he wants to do before his death is just to watch the fucking ball drop. That's it. Nothing more. So he, his, his lame subplot is just to get his doctor, played by Carrie Always, who has kind of let himself go, and his nurse Amy, played by Halle Berry, to sort of keep him alive and to just take him outside of the hospital room to go up on the roof just to watch the freaking ball drop. Where's the story to that? And then once the ball drops, then I could die in peace. I don't care about the people who I've made angry. I don't care about reuniting with my long lost daughter or something. No, fuck that. I just want to watch the ball drop. Nothing more, nothing less. End of discussion. Stupid. Just plain stupid. Oh, and if it doesn't get any more dumber than this, this subplot, this substory is even worse. All right, we get uh, two married, a uh, pair of married couples. We have Tess and Griffin Byrne, played by Jessica Beale and Seth Myers. They are expecting a child who could end up being the potential candidate for the first child born in the new year. And then we are met by another married couple who's also expecting a child. They are Grace and James Schwab, played by Sarah Paulson and Till Schweiger. And they're also hoping that their newborn child will be the first born of the new year. And for what? Well, it just so happens that the first child born in the new year, the married couple will get a nice sum of cash. And I'm talking $25,000. That's really all they care about. They don't care that the most precious gift that they could get is the birth of a child. Oh, no. They don't give a shit about that. No, 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 no. They want the child to come out. The few seconds after the clock strikes midnight, just so that they could get the bun out of the oven and collect the cash. And it doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl. Just get the fuck out of, just get the fuck out of my wife's chest, so I can, so you could come into our lives, and we could go and cash in our twenty-five thousand dollar check at the bank tomorrow morning, or whenever the bank is open after the holiday season. Stupid. 
just plain stupid. Near, okay, and then near the middle of the of where the hottest party of the year is about to commence, we have a caterer named Laura, played by the queen of neuroticism herself, Catherine Heigl, who's at a crossroads with her rock star musician, Daniel Jensen, played by John Bon Jovi. Oh, of course, he's going to play a rock musician. I'd be surprised if he actually turned to hip-hop or R&B. But since, hey, John Bon Jovi is a rock star, so he's just practically playing John Bon Jovi. What's the point of him just changing his name to Daniel Jensen? Just be John Bon Jovi playing John Bon Jovi. So anyways, he wants to reconcile their differences after a past incident where he walked out of her life a year prior to the events that are about to unfold. Yeah. And they are met with uh, contrived comic relief from Sofia Vergara and Russell Peters as their as fellow chefs, Ava and Sunil, whom, if they were just edited out of the script, nobody would really give a damn. I guess you could also say the same thing for... Uh, the spiritual doctor Morissette, played by Carla Guccino, if she was taken out of the, if she was edited out, nobody would really know the fucking difference. Because those three roles don't necessarily mean shit. Meanwhile, Jensen's uh, backing vocalist, her name is Elise, played by Leah Michelle, who still seems to be stuck in glee mode, is stuck in an elevator with a comic illustrator named Randy, played by Ashton Kutcher, as he's trying to make her way to the ball dropping ceremony early. I mean, she wants to try and make it to the the ball drop, but uh, she's stuck in the elevator with Randy. And once again, we have Ashton Kutcher once again playing uh, his typical cynical, stoned up man type of persona. Like, dude, like, why do you always have to play these kind of roles, man? I mean, it's so hung out, dude. Yeah, once again, he's kind of playing a fucking stoner again. Like, dude, where's your versatility, man? Come on. Spice it up a bit. Do something original. You're just, once again, being typecast. Leah Michelle, you could probably say the same thing about her, too. <sighs> wow. All right, then we have uh, Sarah Jessica Parker and Abigail Breslin. They're playing a mother and daughter duo with Kim and Haley Doyle. Once again, like I said, I still kind of find it awkward to see Sarah Jessica Parker and Zach Efron play off as brother and sister. I mean, Sarah Jessica Parker looks her age. Maybe even older. Just saying. Anyways, uh, they're the mother-daughter duo of Kim and Haley Doyle, in which Haley is a teenager. She wants to spend the New Year's Eve bash with her friends, but her overbearing, overprotective mother wants to play the mother hen, and she just wants to chill out with her daughter. But the daughter wants to be the adult chick or the adolescent chick who just wants to step outside the coop for a bit to be with her friends. And so then, you know, there's kind of a bit of a an awkward scene, epic chase between Kim and Haley.
And Haley, of course, wants to spend time with her her stoner boyfriend named Anders Sean Anderson, played by Jake T. Austin, who could really take a few lessons in acting classes. Just a suggestion. Meanwhile, we have Times Square Vice President. Her name is Claire Morgan, played by Hilary Swank. She wants to literally get the ball rolling, or in this case, dropping. But there's a snag. There seems to be a technical glitch in the ball. And if the ball does not drop by midnight, well, she should just pick up the newspaper and look for other job options. Because if the ball doesn't drop, she's going to be fired. Okay, so to console with her problems is uh, her, an officer named Lieutenant Brandon Do Brandon. Nolan, played by Ludacris. And, of course, to finish off the anticlimactic short stories, we have Josh Duhamel. He's a record executive named Sam Ahern Jr., who feels determined that he'll meet the girl of his dreams. Who it is? I'm not going to tell. And even if I tell, who gives a shit? And while they're at it, they may as well cobble in more high-prolific celebrities like Ryan Seacrest, Matthew Broderick, why not, since he's married to Sarah Jessica Parker, Ryan Seacrest, since he's the host of the New Year's Eve bash. He's been doing it since he took over Dick Clark's place in 2011. And former New York City Mayor Michael B Bloomberg, for good measure, so that we can get all in on this anticlimactic abomination of a movie. Most of these convoluted subplots are under the penmanship of Catherine Fugate, which was customized to gather as many top celebrities to perform while not garnering any emotional impact to the respected characters. And to make matters worse, why is it that it's this day in this year? Why is it that it's around this time of the year in particular to have these emotional upheavals when there is no necessity for it? New Year's Eve is not necessarily a romantic themed holiday. It's just the the ending of the year. It's just the starting of a just you know flipping the next day to a new calendar, a new year, a new era, new this, new that. There doesn't necessarily have to be any kind of kissy kissy stuff. It's New Year's. It's to drop the ball. It's to drink champagne. It's to have. It's to you know have some uh, hors d'oeuvres and finger food and cheese and crackers and stuff like that. That's what New Year's Eve is about. It's simple. It's simplistic. It doesn't have to be all kissy kissy. And then, you know, with the Paul drops, should all acquaintance be forgot and never comes to mind. Yeah, that's all that it, there is to it. It doesn't necessarily have to be about kissy, kissy, romantic. No, nothing at all like that. Sure, Valentine's Day wasn't particularly that great of a movie, but at least when it comes to romance in the air, it is a holiday of that magnetic approach that is synonymous with the whole kissy kissy stuff and the box of candy and the cards and the romance and Cupid drawing his arrow. Here's day failed because romance is not a holiday theme. And had it not been for the all-star cast that you could point fingers towards, this movie would be vapid and uninspiring and gives you a little reason to care about each of the characters and the situations they are facing. So in other words, like what I'm saying here is, is that 
all the reason why people would probably come to this movie is to point fingers. It would be like, oh, that's Zac Efron. Oh, that's Michelle Pfeiffer. <gasps> John Bon Jovi. Yeah. That would be the only sole reason why to watch this this fucking atrocity. Other than that, this movie would be something that nobody would really give two fucks about. So, with all the unfulfilled subplots delivered here, if there was anyone that maybe I had a little bit of investment in, was the Josh Duhamel story, as I was actually kind of waited on bated breath to see who this outstanding mystery girl that melted this poor gentleman's heart. But the results came out that Sam may see the attraction in the woman only for us to be more disappointed. So instead of being giddy like, wow, I took my hand and instead of like, oh, no, instead what I did was, Yes, this movie had a fuck you ending to it. Sure, the girl doesn't necessarily have to be a model with a well-sculpted body, but surely he could have found better than what was given to him. I could never understand what he saw in her, knowing that there were other female characters in this movie who were more positive in terms of outlook and personality. A whole angle felt forced and was made to succumb to the conclusion that beauty was in the eye of the beholder. The whole unraveling felt cheap and ruins the last piece of anything in this movie that makes it revealing. For a movie that's just short of the two hour mark, this film will cure one's insomnia with each scene and drags us to a big plate of nothing. For the purpose of the movie, New Year's Eve, is for the sake of product placement. Every scene, you'll see a brand name product materializing before your eyes. So my advice to you is to make your season merrier. Go out, spend time with family and friends, relax, do anything. Don't get stuck watching this this abortion of a movie. Or if you like ensemble films, then I guess the best thing for you to do is Watch Love Actually instead. Now I should know I should not have talked ill. I shouldn't talk ill towards the dead. You know, Gary Marshall has always been a well-respected director over the years. Screen, on the, on the big screen and the small screen. I mean, hey, he's the guy who brought us Happy Days. And Happy Days is like probably one of the greatest TV comedies of all time if you grew up in the 70s and the 80s. And it also launched some other great spin-offs too, like Laverne and Shirley, Mark and Mindy. Sure, there was a few crappy ones, like Blansky's Beauties and Johnny Loves Chachi, but hey, we're not all perfect. Gary Marshall has often had a history of directing some very, very emotionally termed complex uh, romantic comedies, situation comedies, and has always been a very, very effective versatile director but it just saddens me that the last three movies of his life were not memorable i would have liked to have seen him do one last movie to direct that would be you know just like the closing chapter of his life and gary marshall you know what you're sadly missed and we do miss you very very much and what and wherever you are, 
I, I leave you at peace. But I'm just sorry to see this, what this movie didn't do very well. Your last three movies were failures. And I guess this is something that you're probably going to be taking with you. What while you're up there in heaven. And I'm sorry that I have to give a low rating for this movie because it actually really bugs me a lot. This movie could have been like Love Actually, but it just failed on so many levels that if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, and it hurts me to say this, but I'll have to give New Year's Eve a 3 out of 10. I just can't recommend it. Sorry. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind. Be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. Now we'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Redrider saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.